evening everybody. Um, my name is Linda Connolly and I am the editor of this book, which we are launching this evening from my sitting room, as you can see. Um, it is interesting and strange times we are living in, but I am really delighted um, that we have so many people signed up to this panel discussion and launch this evening. And I am going to give a short introduction to the book to start with and tell you a little bit about it and how it came about. And then uh, we'll move on and have some short panel discussions with some of the contributors um, with an, uh, some uh, time built in for some poetry and music as well. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to say it's, um, it's, it, it feels like a huge achievement to have finished this book at a time when everybody has been under so much pressure. And I think it makes it uh, all the more special in a way this evening um, to be doing this launch. Normally we'd probably be in a university or somewhere in Dublin all together. And I hope we have an opportunity again to meet and to discuss further um, the, the, the contents of this book and the chapters which were written uh, by a number of scholars. So I'm going to start with just introducing the book um, and really just to tell you a little bit about its genesis and also how it progressed and, and, and as I said, led to this um, collection uh, between two covers, if you like. And this, the idea for this book started around the time of the commemoration of the 1960 Rising. And it was really becoming apparent that as the decade of commemorations moved on, that although there was some attention being paid to women and a lot of work has been done on women's role in revolution and also I suppose the way in which the revolution impacted women, it was clear that in the commemoration of 1916 and 2016, a range of new questions were arising. And there was some attention in that year, a lot of attention on you know, the role of women as combatants, uh, which is very important, but the debate was beginning to widen out. So it seemed timely to I suppose, start a project funded by the Irish Research Council, and I want to acknowledge the council. They are particularly important for funding uh, research on, on women and feminist research in Ireland, and I want to thank them for a new foundations grant, uh, which has supported my own research, but also the publication of this book and the conference uh, in 2017 that led to the book. And, you know, th that really, in a way, it was necessary to ask new kinds of questions. And this was really enabled, I think, by the new kinds of sources that have become available in recent years. Um, two of the, the book contributors here this evening, uh, both Margaret Ward and Louise Ryan, who you will meet in a moment, both really can be described as suppose, as pioneers of two aspects of this collection. One, Margaret's work on uh, women and revolution in her, her pioneering text, Unmanageable Revolutionaries, which has served as a baseline for so many of us um, over, over the years that followed. And then Louise, your essay, your 2000 essay on the violence women experienced in the revolution, um, which really, I suppose, laid down a marker in terms of the idea that women weren't impacted um, by, in particular, the second phase of revolution that we're talking about in this book, uh, the war of independence, and then leading into the civil war and its aftermath. So, so I'm particularly pleased that both Louise and Margaret are in this book because they, I feel like, were asking these questions long before uh, many of the rest of us in many ways and really have given us a foundation. So we're very much building on the work that has been done but looking at the new range of sources available that allow us to ask different kinds of questions about the role of women specifically and the relationship between women and the Irish Revolution. So this seemed uh, important and timely. And um, secondly, as it was very important to focus on women and to do so uh, by bringing together scholars with different perspectives and I suppose sharing that kind of collaboration, the way in which you know, we can read sources differently across our disciplines. Um, for instance, as we will see again later on, 
Abba McDaid looks at the role of literature and the relationship between uh, uh, understanding um, the, the, the course of the revolution, but also the kinds of things reading literature can tell us that perhaps a state document or a military document um, isn't able to do. So, so, so broadening out the way in which we approach the analysis of revolution. I suppose in terms of my own work, I've been studying revolutions my whole career, in particular uh, the role of the women's movement and, and, and the, the revolutionary impact and role of feminism, uh, both on Ireland throughout the 20th century into the 21st century, but also the role of feminism in terms of challenging um, academic thought and paradigms, uh, challenging the very idea of revolution and the narrow ways in which that can be conceived and applied, uh, not least um, being applied in ways that actually didn't include women both as revolutionaries, but also as women as uh, civilians. So we have a lot to learn, I think, by pooling our expertise. And I'm very proud, I think, of the collaboration and the way in which we have shared uh, our expertise um, in this collection. So, um, so I'm not going to say too much more. Um, the book um, is published by Irish Academic Press, and because we can't sell it here in my sitting room, um, it, it is available online. And, um, and I do want to thank Irish Academic Press um, you know, for, for, for producing such a, such a beautiful book cover. There's a Jack B. Yates cover and um, some of the uh, women from Cork on the back uh, um, and uh, have done a, a brilliant job and they were absolutely brilliant to work with. And I want to thank them very much, uh, Connor, uh, Maeve and Patrick in Irish Academic Press for publishing this book. So um, enough from me. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my own chapter a bit later. Um, I am going to move on to the first panel. Um, and so the book is divided into three sections. And uh, we're going to have three panels, if you like. Um, so, so part one of the book is, is really looking at, the, the subtitle of the book is uh, Feminism, um, Activism and Violence. And the first part of the book really focuses on both the, the, the feminism and the activism part uh, more so. So I go to, um, so chapters uh, one and two, you know, looking at um, national, nationalism and feminism and, and feminists as revolutionaries. So um, have we got, can we see, I'm going to invite on Louise and Louise Ryan, Professor Louise Ryan. Hi Louise, who is joining us from London. <laughs> and, and Professor Lucy McDermott, who is there somewhere, who's joining us from New York. So we're very cosmopolitan indeed this evening. Um, so hi there, hi both, you're very welcome. And thank you so much for your contribution to the book. Um, so, uh, Louise, I'll start with you. So the, the title of your chapter is Nationalism and Feminism, the Complex Relationship Between the Suffragist and Independence Movements in Ireland. Um, so I'm going to ask you, why was feminism so important in this phase of revolution? Thanks very much, Linda, and good evening, everybody. Greetings from London. I feel like the Eurovision Song Contest and the votes from the London jury are as follows. Um, it's great to be here tonight, and it's, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the book. And I'm so grateful, Linda, that you persevered with we were going to have a launch and we were going to come together and celebrate the book despite everything else that's going on. So well done for bringing us all together with the lovely Christmas tree as well. It really sets the tone. Mm -hmm. and, and for being such a, a, a humorous and patient and, and well-spirited editor as well. It's been a pleasure working with you on the book. So in answer to your question, um, I think it's really important to look at the diversity and the complexity of women's voices during this period. There's always a risk, I suppose, that the, the nationalist voice is so strong that it risks kind of silencing or we risk overlooking some of the other dynamics that were going on in Irish society at that time. And it's just such an incredibly rich period in Irish history. Those early decades of the 20th century, fascinating in so many ways. 
And it's not just women in nationalism, it's the suffrage movement, but it's also women in the trade union movement and many other reforms and campaign groups that were going on, raising all sorts of issues around women and children um, at that time in Irish history. And we, we often don't hear as much about those. And I suppose it's about trying to understand the complexity of those different voices, that there wasn't just this one kind of monolithic nationalist agenda, but there were other voices who were looking at different issues from different perspectives. And some of those, of course, some of the suffragists were also nationalists and they were also very committed to the nationalist cause, but they weren't all uh, of that persuasion. There were some unionists and there were some who were critical of both perspectives, some pacifists amongst the feminist movement as well. So it's really about trying to understand this rich tapestry of, of activism that was going on and trying to see how they interacted, but also some of the disagreements and tensions between them so that we can come to a more nuanced understanding. And I think the other thing that's important in doing that is, of course, the suffragists in particular were operating on such an international stage. And they were very much part of a wider international women's movement, a wider international feminist movement in many respects. And so they were also keen to acknowledge the issues around nationalism, the campaign for Irish independence, but also to see this bigger international agenda, especially during World War I with the pacifist movement and everything. So it helps to also put the Irish situation on that bigger international stage. Sure, absolutely. And one of the things we've tried to do in the book is do exactly that, to broaden out the analysis into the, the international context and begin to ask more comparative questions, isn't it? You, you mentioned India um, in, in the chapter as well as being a point of comparator. Do you want to just say a little bit about that and, and as to why India might be an interesting uh, case in point in terms of understanding the role of feminism in the Irish Revolution in this period? Yeah, India is a very interesting example. There are others as well, like Poland, for example. There are many countries that were also embroiled in kind of anti-colonial struggles against, um, in the case of Poland, against a bigger aggressive neighbour, really trying to fight for the, the sovereignty of a, of a new Polish nation state at that time. And the same was happening in India, of course. And, and women's suffrage was taking place against that very charged background. And so what we see in all of those examples is the way in which feminists were arguing for the rights of women while having to also tread a very fine path in relation to this bigger and louder and more aggressive campaign for the rights of the nation. And particularly in relation to Ireland and India, there was this question of priority and timing. And both women in Ireland and in India were being told by nationalist leaders, just wait, have patience. You don't want to be going to Westminster cap in hand looking for votes for women. Wait, support the independence movement. And then as soon as Ireland becomes independent or India becomes independent, then, you know, women will then get all the rights they're entitled to. And in both of those situations, you have feminists who were a little bit apprehensive about that argument and insisted that women's rights needed to be front and centre and that women were reluctant to postpone their rights until after, you know, into some distant unknown future. So we see those kinds of very similar issues being played out. Of course, there were big differences between Ireland and India as well. But that point of similarity, I think, is very interesting. And it's something that plays out time and time again. We're still seeing these kinds of issues around priority and women being told to wait their turn. We sort out the big issues first and then we will get around to looking after the women. So these are things that, again, I think the lesson that I would take away from this is the importance of adopting a historical lens and you know we're both sociologists linda but we're sociologists who are very attuned to history and very influenced by history in both of our work and i think sociology can learn so much from history and that's why bringing up these examples and exploring these examples i think really helps us to understand those those complex social dynamics absolutely of course i agree and obviously sociology is a discipline founded on the social upheavals and revolutions of the 19th century. And of course, we must include feminism as part of that revolution, which is uh, exactly what, what we're doing here. Um, thank you, Louise. I'm going to move on, Lucy. Um, Lucy Professor Lucy McDermott, uh, you're very welcome. And thank you, I know there's a time difference, so thank you for, for, for joining us. 
Um, so your chapter, chapter two, uh, intriguing title, Comradeship, Feminists and Revolutionaries in Holloway Prison, 1918 to 1919. Um, so I'm just going to ask you, Lucy, um, you know, the idea of comradeship is really interesting as it applies to, to women's lives, isn't it? Um, so I just want to ask you, how did you think of writing on this topic and, and why did it appeal to you? Okay. Hi, Linda, and um, thank you for everything, including the wonderful conference that generated this book. That was a lot of fun, too. Yes. It was lovely meeting all these people. Um, some of them, like Louise, whose work I knew but whom I hadn't met, and now I see why our chapters are so close to each other because everything I say is consistent with what Louise said. Um, so I wrote about the presence in Holloway Jail together of Maud Gunn, Kathleen Clark, Constance Markevich, and very briefly, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, the first three women in jail because of the German plot in uh, spring 1918 and Hannah Sheehy Skeffington because of violations of the Defense of the Realm Act. And, my original inspiration was really Kathleen Clark's wonderful memoir, Revolutionary Woman, edited by Helen Litton, who's out there somewhere in Zoom land. Um, I loved Kathleen Clark's account of the time in prison because it was it was roommate issues. You know, it was, can you come in my room or not? You're messy and I'm neat. You're gaining weight. You're losing weight. I'm more important than you are. No, she's more important than I am. And didn't she say this? It was all roommate issues, really, but with these famous, important Republican nationalist Irish women. So it had there was a lot of lot of um, more significance than just you know your own your own roommates. Um, there was also lots and lots of material in the women's own voices. It wasn't state sources or official sources. It was in their own voices. Kathleen Clark's memoir and also notes for the memoir in the National Library, the things that she didn't want to publish. And thanks to Fanula Walsh for going over those. Um, it, Markevich's prison letters to her sister, Kathleen Clark's letters to her sister Madge Daly in Limerick, and thanks to Helen Litton for sending me copies of these because they haven't been published. Maud Gunn's very long witness statement, and thanks to Margaret Ward for sending me Hannah Sheehy Skeffington's uh, brief account of her time in Holloway before it was published. So when I had read all of these, I enjoyed them so much. They were so gossipy and so full of both antagonism and friendship that I thought, this is a play. This is by Tom Stoppard. This is something like travesties. This is a hilarious play. The dialogue is already written. You know, there's nothing left. Or maybe it's like Sartre we close with the three people who don't know why they're in the same room until they figure that, trying to figure out that they're all in hell together. Um, of course, these women aren't in hell, but there was something about the, the sharpness of the contrast in their personalities at the same time as their, the shared commitment and the friendship that they were all aware of, um, the mutual antagonisms and affection that made it just wonderful with all this rich archival material that hadn't been considered. And I want to say that just this morning, I read through Mary McGallett's post that the Abbey Theater is looking for plays on this later period in the decade of commemoration. This play is already written by these women. You just have to put it together. But it appealed to me particularly because, as in my book on Irish controversies, I'm really much more interested in internal conflict in Ireland than in conflict between Ireland and other countries. Yes. Because as, as Louise was just pointing out, there's no reason to treat Ireland as a homogeneous society. There's too many interesting fault lines. And there's all, no reason to treat all of the women or even all of the Republican women as homogeneous because they're not. And so one thing you can see in this material is Irish Republican women in prison fighting over identity categories. And yeah. I'll just mention the most important one, which is Kathleen Clark's insistence that she is more Irish than the other two. That they are arguing, she says, they're arguing about who was more important in Dublin Castle society, and then each one gossiping to her about the, so that both Markevich and Gunn 
secretly talk to Clark and uh, complain about the other ones. Um, that's why it's sort of the roommate thing. So Kathleen Clark politicized just the women there in Holloway Prison. They, they weren't just sisters together, though they all did have sisters who were part of a larger sisterhood. Um, she said she was a buffer state. Um, so she's already thinking in macro political terms, but applying them to these women's relationships. Um, when the prison matron asks Kathleen Clark as she's leaving her exit interview, uh, she asks her, why are you more hostile than the other two? They were very nice to me. Why weren't you? And Kathleen Clark says, and I will read the quote, I am Irish, purely Irish. And the other two ladies are of English descent. So even there, I mean, you know, I think Constance Markiewicz was right out there in the rising with the guns and everything, but Kathleen Clark is more Irish. And it was that kind of argument um, that interested me. And I, if I can just say one more thing about the politicizing. Kathleen Clark politicized her cell, her prison cell. Um, it was it was a miniature Ireland, and she she controlled the borders, and she got great pleasure out of not allowing Markevich in because she was too messy. She left cigarette ashes everywhere, and she her paint got everywhere, and then Constance would sit outside Kathleen's door and say, "I'm lonely," and Kathleen Clark say, "You can only come in if you need." So there was, you know. There was a, a kind of miniature power struggle right there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a, it's fascinating, isn't it? The interrelationships between the women and the tensions, and and again, that's another way of showing how the interconnections, you know, really, you know, shed shed new light, if you like, in the friendships and the comradeship. So, um, so thank you, Lucy. I'm going to move on. Um, so uh, we have Claire. Hi, Claire. Claire McGain. Hi. How are you? And Good. Thanks for being here. And Claire, uh, your um, chapter, um, so it's chapter five. I'm just jumping a bit forward because it relates to the, the, the revolutionary women, if you like, section. Um, and you're looking at women's political representation in Dáil Éireann in revolutionary and post-revolutionary Ireland. And um, it's, again, very intriguing, a bit like what Lucy and Louise were just saying there these assumptions about, about women that seem to exist and, and, and take hold over time and um, this idea of the widow's mandate, this sort of sexist idea that women who, were, who became political representatives because they were the widows of men who were considered to be more politically active um, has become very embedded in the literature. And then the assumptions about the, the anti-treaty uh, women who are obviously very powerful as well. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about that, the widow's mandate and the assumptions about the women in the anti-treaty debates? Absolutely, I suppose. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to, 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 to be part of the book in the first place. It really was an honor and particularly to work with women scholars who have really influenced thinking on women in politics and I would of course put yourself in there Linda and Margaret and Louise in particular so it was it really uh, has been wonderful I suppose yes it was really important to me to I suppose in many ways do a reassessment or a reappraisal of the role of women parliamentarians in this period um, and too often um, you know the, the, I suppose I can categorize the women who were elected kind of in the early, the first 50 years of um, kind of the, you know, the, the period from independence up until the 1977 um, election. And the first category of women were those six women elected in 1991. <clears throat> uh, you have your Markovich, Dr. Ada English, Kathleen Clark, who has been mentioned, etc. And these women were often considered at the time to be I suppose bereaved women, um, very emo too emotional for politics, too bitter for politics, and um, the fact that four of those six women had very close connections to men who had been been killed as a result um, of the revolutionary period, and that was seen to colour or to influence their thinking. And of course, as probably a lot most people know, um, on on this uh, call, all six women in 1921 voted against the Anglo-Irish Treaty, and in doing that, that kind of again created this assumption that they were too 
bitter and too inflexible for politics. In actual fact, of course, those women themselves have been highly, you know, regarded activists. I would, you know, Kathleen Clark is a woman I would come to again and again on this point. But even someone like, um, like Mrs. Pierce herself, I mean, it was Dr. Ada English herself in the treaty debates who pointed out that Mrs. Pierce had influenced the thinking of her sons. Um, and that was really important to me to unpack and, and to look at those women. The influence of that or the impact of that, of course, also was that kind of following the revolutionary period, we see political opportunities for women close. And what happens is that the vast majority of women elected up until 1977 really were widows um, of deceased male TDs. And again, I would I would say that the analysis, the assessment of those women has, you know, have, is in need of reassessment. And in many ways, I would say was was sexist. Um, these women themselves, though we can't deny their influence to, to, to male TDs, were highly active parliamentarians in their own right, active constituency workers. And though there has been a tendency in previous work to say that they didn't represent women's issues, in actual fact, they did. Um, in their constituency work and in the types of parliamentary questions they asked, which would have often been um, along the lines of the prices of goods for housewives, children's issues, etc. So I think we need to rethink what we mean when we say these women, you know, represented or didn't represent women. Um, I'll just give one uh, example of one of these women, um, a woman called Mary Bridget Ryan, who was elected in 1948, held that seat until 1961. Um, she was a mother of eight children, um, uh, young children, when, when, she was, when she was widowed. And the, the, the kind of the mantra or the narrative that used to go around Tipperary was, whenever you had a constituency related problem, we'll go to Mary Bridget. Um, and I have been fortunate to meet the families of many of these women who, and it's a fortune these women didn't leave behind archives because they felt their work was not significant. And of course, um, of course it was. So I suppose that's what I was trying to do in, in the book to kind of take a more kind of critical assessment of these women and consider the highly male gendered institution into which they were elected. Sure, uh, very quick question. It's an enormous question. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, commemoration relation to Cork at the mi minute. Mary McSweeney, um, what is your very brief assessment of her role? Because, you know, there's a bit of historical revisionism, I think. Um, you know, Ma Mary was far, far more liked, I think, shall we say, than, than, than many of the accounts um, tend to convey. What's, what's your take on, on, on McSweeney? I think Mary, I think Mary McSweeney was a highly effective legislator in her own right, who I think there has been a lot of revision around her, this, you know, this perception. I mean, she was inflexible. She was quite dogmatic in her approach. Um, <clears throat> having said that, she she herself, so she was a, a good example of, of a woman TD who she she her a lot of the men would have considered her views, her very, very dogmatic views, might I say, on the tree, she to been influenced by the death of her of her brother, of course, who had died on hunger strike. In actual fact, Mary McSweeney herself had been a highly committed activist prior to, 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 to this and actually would have been very influential in the thinking of her brother um, in relation to, to politics. So I do think it's important. I know that um, there is some ongoing work um, on her at the moment by other uh, by historians and elsewhere. And I do think it's important that we do take a broader kind of look at her. I mean, one thing just to say that in the treaty debates, she spoke longer than anybody. And she was kind of the subject of some jokes in this area. But she herself refused to bring up the image of her brother Terence, even though others brought it up in her name, which I think is quite significant. Sure. Okay. Um, great. Thank you, Claire. Um, just to say, the for, for people looking in, it's a bit of a disadvantage to not be able to see everybody. But just to, I should I didn't say at the beginning, you're all very welcome. But I we can't take too many questions. But if you want to put something in the chat. Um, I'll try and get to one or two at the end of each panel, but obviously they can be looked at afterwards as well by the panelists. So don't be shy about um, putting a question in if you want to. So, so again, uh, thank you, Claire. So again, that's interesting, the way in which some of these women become defined by their relationships with men as opposed to being as with activists in their, their own right and the need for that kind of complex reappraisal that's occurring. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to move on, I'm going to step back to chapter three and four and put them together in a way because we, we couldn't write a book of, on this subject um, by not having a very uh, close analysis of coming them on. And 
Um, so I'm delighted to um, welcome Margaret Ward, who is the author of chapter three, and John Borkenover, who is the author of chapter four. Um, and here we have really, again, the sort of the gift of the new archives really in recent years have, uh, you know, again, provided all kinds of fascinating new avenues um, for looking at, 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 at coming on. And I, I'm going to start with you, Margaret, just the title of your chapter, Gendered Memories and Belfast Coming Amon, 1917 to 1922. So, so, so just say I'm delighted that we have a, a chapter specifically on Belfast. We need an awful lot more work done you know, on, 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 on the North, on, on, Be on Belfast in particular, um, in this period. But it's absolutely wonderful to have a chapter on, on, on coming them on specifically, looking at the new sources. So um, I'm just going to ask you um, two questions, really. Uh, what new evidence does your chapter contribute, do you think, to the scholarship on coming them on, including in the context um, of Belfast? And then I, I'd ask you, I suppose, to talk a little bit about the new sources and how they've um, enhanced that understanding. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you, even though I can't see um, everybody, but it's great to be with colleagues. And thank you, Linda, for, for getting us all together. Um, it's wonderful to, to, to be able to talk about this book um, in a way that, you know, I think some of us thought would never be possible a few months ago. Um, I was really delighted to be able to start writing about Belfast Common Amman once I felt that there were some sources there. It was very difficult before that because um, one of the main reasons is that Belfast in that period was a war city, but it was also a city where the Republican nationalist community, however one wants to describe it, was very isolated in a very hostile community, larger community, and they weren't able to keep notes. So you have that compounded by the fact that women tend not to keep personal papers, or if they do, their family gets rid of them. So even, for example, one woman, Elizabeth Delaney, who was a, a captain in one of the Belfast, in the West Belfast branch of Cumann Amman, um, her family contacted me to see if I knew about her, because all they knew was that she'd been active, they had no papers. And so when um, the pension applications started to come online, she wasn't in the first tranche, but, but came up after that. And we were finding out, myself as a researcher and those as family members about her at the same time. So really without the, the new evidence, we would know very little about Kaman Amman in the North. But what I tried to do at first was when the witness statements were released by the Bureau of Military History, I thought this would be a great opportunity, first of all, to see. But in fact, there were very few women from the North included in that. It is men, mainly Dublin based and it's also very male. And the women from the North who were included only talked about their role around the 1916 rising. There was nothing afterwards in the War of Independence. But looking at 45 witness statements of men, not necessarily Belfast men, but men who fought in the North at one stage, to see what they remembered or talked about or gave um, reference to uh, help given by women. And that was really very interesting because it starts to bring you into the whole area of memory or mismemory or hidden memory um, and so, and, and because women's work is invisible in so many areas of life, it's also invisible in a sense in revolutionary activity. Yes. So the men would talk about um, burning the customs house, for example, or attacking RIC barracks, and they would never mention the fact that they were helped by women. And it's only reading individual pension applications do we hear, say, from Winifred Carney that she did the reconnaissance for the income tax office, or another woman supplied the weaponry and took it away at the end after the attacks of the RIC barracks, etc. So women were there. Very few men seem to have noticed them or given them credit when they were remembering themselves. So then when you move on to the 
pension applications and trying to find women's own voices. There are now um, 16 applications online from, from women fr who were active in Belfast. I haven't looked wider than that in detail at the moment because it's so interesting. And it's not only what women say, and you've got all sorts of really interesting kind of pen portraits of what women are, are, are doing at that time, is how they're treated when they come to make their applications and come to be assessed by the assessor. Because the assessor isn't interested in coming a man activity. That is really women's work. They're only interested in military activity, the activity when they're supporting the men, which is when they really are transgressive and they've moved into the, the men's field, if you like, and what they're talking about then, and they have a really hard time of it. A lot of them don't get their uh, pensions. Um, one woman says that, you know, other than engaging in armed combat, I did everything that the men did. What else do you want me to say about my activities? Another woman says, I was treated so rudely by the assessor, and if I have to appear again, I won't take it this time. I mean, these were women who were really politically and militarily active and they were enraged at how they were treated and they kind of fought back verbally but you also see um because that you know they, they, their own word isn't taken for granted the men have to say oh yes rose black was very active or you know whoever and they have to verify that and it's very interesting in the verification by men and how they elaborate on some of the work, because some of the men are very sympathetic to the women, and, and, and some men just refuse to sign any statements on behalf of women. So the, the gender dynamics there are very interesting. Fascinating. So, so that suggests even though we have a, a lot of new sources or additional sources, they're also limited in some ways, aren't they? And the, the narrative, the, how the narrative is constructed is quite important as well, yeah. It is, and, and, and I'm thinking also of work, again, work that Louise has done when she's looked at male narratives yes. of the rising, and you, you know, and you compare the Tom Barrys and, and the other people, you know, and what they have said about it, the kind of boy's own thing, and then you look at, at what the women are saying and how different it is. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and of course then you, one of the, the themes, again, of the book is that you know, the, not just the, you know, in the post-revolutionary period, trying to explain the subsequent exclusion of some of these women from political and social life, you know, uh, you know, a lot of them couldn't get jobs if they had to leave the country or, and again, Claire, you're looking at that in your chapter in terms of the political institutions that, you know, the political aspects of the revolution also, in a sense, subsequently excluded women. And that's a very important part of this, this story, I think, as well. I, th I think it's fascinating the the what you what you get. I mean, women. So many women don't apply for pensions either because they don't want anything to do with the free state or they're not in financial need. So the ones who are applying are usually the ones who are practically destitute. And they talk about in Belfast particularly, women who were seen as Republican activists lost their job during the War of Independence, were never employed again. Uh, one woman went blind after her prison experience, etc. There are, uh, you know, other people's family businesses were destroyed. You have some really terrible, heartrending tales of how people have survived in a very hostile environment afterwards. And you can understand from that why you don't see women in public life afterwards as well. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Margaret. And we'll get to some of those themes in the in the next session because we will be looking at the kind of the, the hidden injuries, trauma, you know, and the impact, um, which is again a very important uh, aspect. Um, thanks, Margaret. I'm going to move on to 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 John Morganova. Um, and so, John, again, your chapter is also on, on coming along and again trying to, I suppose, open up new angles or new lines of analysis, like like Margaret has been, and. Common Amman, quite widely looked at, you know, in relation to, you know, the earlier periods, but the Civil War, tell us about the focus of your chapter and why did you focus on the Civil War in particular? 
Well, first of all, I'm, I'm trying to rein in my imposter syndrome after following Margaret Ward and having heard, <laughs> listened to Louise Ryan before. So uh, uh, in that company, um, the what again, like Margaret was saying, uh, the military service pension collection has just given us this great new source, you know, dozens, scores and scores of files. I probably looked at 100 files uh, of, of activists in, in the Civil War period. And like my work generally... I, I take a subaltern, subaltern view of revolutionary Ireland, and I really like to look at how activism and organizations look at the grassroots level, you know, how things, how things work and how things function. And so for me, uh, the coming to on material in the uh, military service pension collection was really uh, illuminating a lot of these hidden uh, workings. Uh, and what becomes also quite apparent when you look at the Civil War is coming to on appears to me anyway to be much more of a martial and visible organization it's much more of a para, it's much more of a, a visible paramilitary organization i think than it had been in the war of independence uh just as these kind of unarmed and occasionally armed combatants and in the conventional phase of the civil war when in dublin and places like tipperary and limerick and cork and elsewhere in conventional battles they're quite visible uh, and then also when the guerrilla war happens, again, they're, they're coming out as quartermasters and combat nurses. They're participating in a lot more operations as participants. They're not necessarily shooting people, but there's also like a lot more carrying of weapons. Uh, there are a lot more armed women. And I think that all of this is coming because the IRA is so much weaker in the Civil War than it had been the War of Independence. It lacks a lot of civil support. Uh, it doesn't really have a political wing anymore. Sinn Féin's gone. Uh, and in this weakened state, there's a vacuum. And I think coming on to really uh, fill that, that vacuum and assert themselves in a way, as Margaret said, which is, which is quite transgressive. Uh, and I think it's probably one of the reasons I think that they become quite uh, closely associated with this militant republicanism uh, in the Civil War, you know, going all the way till the end of 1923. Okay, and maybe just tell us briefly about some of the women, so some of the names of the women who, who were quite prominent in this period, who you think had a, an influential role. I mean, you looked at, one thing I can say about the book is there's a massive amount of um, sources, there are a huge amount of sources, um, original sources informing all the chapters. So I noticed you had quite a number of names I hadn't recognized before. So do you want to tell tell us maybe one or two of those quickly? I, I actually don't have the book in front of me, so I'm not going to name I'm not going to name names, Linda. I won't go. I won't turn them forward. But uh, but but what you see is um, you have people in places like like Wexford seem to have a really active, well organized yeah. coming them on. They have what they call uh, AC ACU units active come on uh, coming units where they, they have women on call just to go out and move guns participate yeah. in participate in and um just just a, a variety of things uh, again a lot of the, and there's a lot of paramilitary activism um the courier network seems to be handed over almost entirely to coming on um the uh safe houses seem to be run almost entirely by coming them on uh, and then um the uh, one thing which which is similar to the War of Independence, propaganda, but propaganda seems to be, again, coming to mind, takes on a, a much more active role in producing propaganda and then also in distributing it. And that dis distribution is quite dangerous. And a number of women are beaten up. Uh, they're, they're beaten while they're putting up, uh, they're distributing, coming to mind, distributing Republican propaganda. And it's quite dangerous. They're shot at. Uh, and, and again, you also see a number of women are killed on active service and come in the Civil War. Uh, yeah. And so what it just seems that it's it's more of a danger. There's more danger. Uh, there's much more proximity to action. Uh, and uh, I think that's all part of this picture in the Civil War. And I think the Civil War is coming on is a bit of a different um, organization than it had been in the War of Independence. OK, OK. So again, I, have, I do have the book in front of me. So I mean, there's a whole range of women here. I'd love to know more about it. Cumber, Cumberford's one. And, uh, is, and yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah. Really, it's, I suppose what it suggests is there's there's an awful lot more work to be done, isn't there? There are an awful lot more, um, you know, certainly potential for oral histories and you know doing research with family um, papers. So so it's really I think for for our future researchers there's an awful lot of pointers here. I think 
So um, thank you, John. I'm going to I'm going to move on. Um, so so we're going to um, so we're going to move on. Thank you, everybody. That's our first panel. Um, and thank you for doing that so efficiently. We, I know our time is limited, so there's an awful lot more we could discuss. But it really is just to give you a flavour um, of the content of the chapters and to thank everyone sincerely for you know the huge amount of research um, they put in to this. Um, part two of the book um, is really, I suppose, um, really deals with the. Uh, impact of the revolution on women and perhaps some of the more thorny and difficult um, questions. And whereas we've just been talking about there, but the very active role of, of women, uh, women's agency. Um, we're going to move on a little bit now and to talk about the conflict and the way in which conflict is and was gendered. And this is a, an area, I suppose, that has opened up um, in recent years, I mentioned Louise's early paper um, uh, in Feminist Review uh, in 2000 uh, uh, with the subtitle Drunken Tans. Nobody can forget that subtitle. And really, for the first time, began to look at the, the forms of violence that were used uh, against women in this period. Um, so, so part two, I'm going to start just to say a little bit about my own chapter. I'm not going to say too much. And then we're going to pause for a minute, uh, pause for thought, I suppose, um, with a poem in a moment before I move on to the other three. Um, and, and just to say a little bit, I know I'm going to be asked a question at the end by, by another member of this panel, um, but just to say a little bit, my own chapter, chapter six, is entitled Towards a Further Understanding of the Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Women Experienced in the Irish Revolution. And here, you know, I draw on my own experience of looking at questions around sexual violence and crime. Um, that work started in the 1970s with rape crisis, with the research I did in the, the first sexual assault units, and really using those tools of analysis to look at whether or not sexual crime was an issue in this period of revolution. And of course, I started this in 2015, 2016, and it's been a slow journey in many ways because it is very difficult to find sources, to find evidence in particular of rape and sexual assault, but it is there. And it is a part of the story of the revolution and one of the more difficult aspects of the revolution. So in my chapter, I look at um, both in the War of Independence and indeed the Civil War, um, gendered violence, forced hair cutting, and the range of evidence, uh, new evidence in recent years um, doing a, a very extensive trawl across a range of sources to look at that, but also at, as, as I say, looking at the more thorny question of sexual violence. And here again, you know, you see uh, evidence of this cropping up in different kinds of collections. Um, also, I have to say, historians um, have been really helpful uh, in terms of if they come across a case, they often let me know um, and that they found it in the middle as a kind of almost a very brief reference in the middle of an otherwise unrelated um, archive or, or set of papers. So it's about sort of gathering together all those bits of evidence to arrive at, at, at I suppose, a more integrated appraisal of whether or not um, sexual violence was part of the revolution. And there are specific cases that I look at. Um, one of the cases um, that is, 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 is more known about, is more prominent, that has been written about, uh, was the case of Eileen uh, Mary Warbuck Burton Biggs and, and Marie Coleman. In a moment, you also, also write about um, Eileen. Um, and, and, and this was um, a particularly prominent uh, case. And I'm going to just pause, pause for a moment. I want to welcome um, Eleanor Hooker. Uh, here this evening. Hi Eleanor. Um, Anne, you might need to. Um, yes, you're there. Hi Eleanor, it's lovely. You're very welcome. It's lovely to see you. Eleanor has written um, a poem um, and sorry I've just got to, I have multiple um, pieces of paper here and, and, and I'm just going to give the title Eleanor. Eleanor is, is a very well known and esteemed uh, poet and writer um, she will be very well known to some of you. Uh, one of her poems was recently shortlisted for the Unpost. Um, is it called Poem of the Year <laughs> Award? Um, 
but but Elmer's work is is, is very well known and um, she's a wonderful poet and and uh, I am, I'm pleased to have got to know Eleanor in recent years and uh, to discuss all these issues and uh, Eleanor has written a poem um it's it, four poems actually isn't it Eleanor you might say a little bit about it but the title of this poem is Returning to the Land of the Dead where Eileen Mary War Warburton bids and um, you wrote it recently as, as a part of um, a series of poems, wasn't it, for the Blue Nib um, journal? Um, yeah, in response to your research and um, the other stuff that we've been discussing over the last few years. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Are, are you happy to read it first, Eleanor? We'll pause for thought just to, to remember Eileen and, and to listen to your wonderful poem. Thank, thank you. And thank you for finding her, bringing her back. Returning to the land of the dead. I daub my face and arms with vodka, an old gardener's trick, so mosquitoes leave off their blood fast. Balanced on a tap of touch and turn against the hand-cranked grinding wheel, the slash hook wets for the cut. Along the foreshore, an August breeze plays water music, tender through each reed. I swing and find my rhythm, and as the thicket of brambles unpuzzle, what was once hidden is now in sight. I, f I feel the first stings on my eyelids, my lips. I tug at my shirt. Wasps cling to my breasts, back, belly. Before the lake closes above me, I see the nest, a parchment ball sliced to reveal deep chambers, its darkest secrets. I swim through the gloom, disturb a pike perfecting toothy menace. Follow launching rails for Vanya to the end of the pier where I break surface a century earlier. As aspens brussle and grieb calls bump the quiet, I test my voice and it returns an echo, sounding time's inevitability. This vintage summer wears long linen skirts and high lace collars, but is not naive, indifferent or plain. In the orchard, I stand beneath a fruit tree, breathe a familiar fermenting scent, Watch five drunken wasps devour a plum, tear at its bruised and broken flesh. In greed lies savagery. One hovers at eye level, daring me to flinch, but recognizing a fighter and my stone cold intention, should it strike, it returns to its feasting. I feel your eyes on me, Eileen. Know you've seen me before and are not afraid. Time exists in a loop here, where past and future are open corridors. You wait by the door to the rose garden, your face in shadow under your straw hat, but I see how you smile at my disheveled ghost, a scrap of endurance newly emerged from the lake. There's no warning I can signal, for already you are lost, terror already visited. But having found you here, I will bring something of you back. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. That was really, really beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, um, and we do remember Eileen and, and all the other women as well, you know, um, as we talk about, you know, these issues. So, so thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, I, it, it, it kind of, it connects very well with moving on to Marie's, Marie Coleman's um, chapter. I'm going to kind of loop them in if that's okay. Um, Thank you, Eleanor. That was really beautiful. It's lovely to just pause and listen to that. Um, Marie, hi, Marie Coleman. We can't hear you, Marie. You're muted. <laughs> right. You can hear me now. I can definitely hear you now. How are you? It's lovely to see you. And yes. Good. Um, and um, I'm sure you'd agree that, that, that um, the, the poem that uh, Emily just read is an absolutely beautiful tribute to Ivy. Mm -hmm. Mm. arises a lot, doesn't she, in, in, in the analysis of, of sexual violence in particular and the Civil War. Your chapter, can I just find the title, be sure I give everyone a title, uh, chapter seven. So, so, so this is again a, a really, this chapter is an incredible, um, I suppose, example of, of the amount of sources and, and the, 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 the trawling that you did. You cover a huge range of sources and the title is um, Compensation claims and women's experience of violence and loss. 
in Revolutionary Ireland, 1921 to 23. So again, bringing us a bit forward, if you like, in, in the periodization. So, so do you want to um, just maybe give everybody a flavor of the, the, the kind of the, the importance of the compensation claims in particular, which again, we've mm -hmm. talked earlier about the, the, the pension uh, applications, the Bureau of Notary History, the, the diaries, et cetera. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about the compensation claims and why they're so important to looking at women's lives and experience of loss and violence in this period. Well, I suppose part of the reason why the focus is 21 to 23 is that most of the compensation schemes deal primarily with the Civil War period. Um, there is, uh, there are some, there's the, um, the Anglo-Irish compensation uh, compensation claims from the War of Independence. Now, to date, all we have on those are ledgers in the National Archives where you can go by county and you could identify names. And I have in the, the case of Longford and those ones, I've been able to see some of the women and work out what happened. Now, I have been told on good authority that there is, quote, a room full of files in the Department of Finance currently being going under undergoing um, cleaning. So there is there, it does appear that there is another very significant okay. collection of files, which I didn't know about when I wrote this, but when we'll see them, I don't know. But one of the boons of the decade of centenaries has been this focus on releasing files. And to date, we've, we've, we've spent a lot, um, we've used a lot of, of files where people talk about what they did. But I think these new, these compensation files, which really have only come online in the last six years. I think it's it's early 2014 the pension files were released. I, I look briefly at the pension files, but I, I don't go into them in great detail. In fact, where, where I do go into them, it's the it's not so much the act, activist files, it's the dependence files that interest me. And there's the particularly sad case of the Perry children where um, the, uh, well, Mrs. Perry, I'll call her, who was described as the unmarried wife of Patrick Perry uh, from the Free State Army who was killed uh, on active service. And initially she was given a pension as a dependent, but then a row arose between her and Perry's mother who claimed that they weren't married and that the mother should get the, the money. Um, needless to say, the, uh, Ernest Blythe unfortunately sided with, uh, with the view that as she was not his legal wife and therefore their children were not legitimate, neither her or the children uh, qualified for um, pensions, even though you can see it, the officials try their best. The officials say, well, in, in Britain, they take the word children to mean natural, in its natural rather than its legal sense. And we could do the same, but unfortunately, Ernest Clyde was having none of it. And it's that these, these children end up in an orphanage in Dublin because of the decision not to give their money any compensation, their mother compensation. And it's those I think it's the dependents, it's the people who are left behind. I think th yeah. that's one area of the, the pension files. We've spent a lot of time looking at the activists. So I, I'd suggest we spend time looking a bit at the dependents. There's a very good file on Roger Casement's sister, for example, which I'm sure uh, is something Lucy would know um, quite a bit about. So th it's those lesser known stories. The other, the other collection, I, I mentioned the pension files a bit, but not, not to a huge extent, because I've written on those elsewhere. The one that I spend most time looking at is the um, the Irish Grants Committee. And this is one which, this is a very good example of women hiding in plain sight. Okay. And I think your your essay, Linda, is a very good example of this, the Tankardstown case that you, you spoke about in the history show. Um, that's in the newspapers. We've spent a lot of time tonight talking about new files. The source has been out there for years and the women have been hiding in plain sight and only now are we discovering them. And the Irish Grants Committee is an example of that. People have been using it for years, for over probably over 30 years, but you have been using it mostly to look at the experience of the Southern Unionists. Uh, people like Mo Moulton started to explore some of the women's experiences of it. And I, I've just taken that on and I've used some examples, but there's uh, really, I, I intend this essay as a guide to others of saying, go look at these files because there is so much about the experience of women. 
and often in these cases, the women won't get compensation for, for various reasons. Maybe they, in the case of the Irish Grants Committee, if they're applying for something that happened during the War of Independence, they're outside the terms of reference. But nevertheless, their retelling of their experience itself is very important. And they, just to go back to Eileen Biggs, yeah. they, her case would have been reasonably well known to historians of the revolution if not to a wider public and i think maybe we're, we're i hope we're doing some her some posthumous justice by uh, uh drawing attention to the ordeal that she went through but there was a throwaway line in her um in her statement her application to the or one of her letters to the grants committee saying and and that what happened to her was so bad and had such a big effect on her family that it led to the, the, her sister, Mrs. Peacock, died. And the first time I read it, I kind of said, oh, that, that's, I imagine that her sister died. Then I went back to it and thought, hmm, I wonder. Because she was saying that Mrs. Peacock died as a result of what had happened to her, to Eileen. So now that the Irish genealogy uh, files, registers of births, marriages and deaths are online, I went digging and I find, sure enough, um, her sister, Mrs. Peacock, who was married to an RIC, a retired RIC doctor, Price Peacock, died from what is pretty obviously was a suicide in Dublin in, I think it's about 1926. Yeah. So it, it, this is compounding. What happened to Eileen herself was bad enough, but we see the compounding of it mm. with that trauma having the effect on Mrs. Biggs's death, as, or M Mrs. Peacock's death as well. So just the the multiplying of the trauma in that case was one of the things I found just more most interesting in in that particular example. But re, I, I intend this. I, I hope every anybody reading this will use this as a guide. It is to show that these compensation files are gold dust. And please please build on what I'm doing here. Take up cases I've mentioned. Do them in more detail because all I could do is really introduce them. Absolutely, and, and I agree 100%, Marie. I mean, it's a ter terrific chapter. You do focus on substantive cases, but I agree with you. Many of the chapters in this collection were pointing the way and saying, look, there's so much more um, to look at here. And you think about it, you know, the, the assumption that, that women weren't really that badly impacted, you know, by the violence, by the conflict, by war, it, it really, it, it, is, it was not the case at all. I mean, you find as well, of course, that Irene, you know, she died in St. Pat's. Mm -hmm. And the, the yep. role of psychiatric um, mm -hmm. institutions or, um, you know, asylums um, plays a big part in some of the, the, the narratives of trauma in this period. And they are, in a sense, you know, I, I love that phrase that I, I, I use in my, uh, from De Cruz, that I use in my own chapter. We're really looking at surviving evidences. So, so the, the women who didn't report or who didn't tell anybody or, you know, we're really only looking at what has survived. But we do need to look harder, and, and exactly that Tankard's case again was a, you know for those who are in, who haven't read the book yet, these are cases um, um, where rape cases that either appear in in as Marie has outlined either in compensation claims or are reported as appearing in the courts and are intertwined uh, with with the civil war or the war of independence. Um, so there are many examples uh, of this, and it's about it really, isn't it, inserting that into into the narrative. Yeah, so, so we, we remember, and I suppose we, you're, you're right, we do, you know, it's not a justice project per se, but we, we are, in a sense, um, engaging in recovery work and giving voice to some of those lost stories and very, um, very difficult questions, aren't they? Mm. Um, so, yeah, so, so I, I'm going to, I mean, we'll come back in a second, I'm just going to move on then to Andy Bielenberg, where are you, I, he's... Um, there. Hiya, I'm, I'm up at the top of the house. Uh, maybe it's at the bottom of the house. Okay, so this is where I do. All, I broadcast my lectures from the attic. It's true. What I've been doing for the last month. So uh, sometimes I come out. One often comes bounding down the stairs. Um, anyway, um, Andy, I go to you, so your chapter again, building very much on, on both my own chapter and, and Marie's in the sense um, we're focusing, I suppose, on women who were injured. In various ways or experienced loss and um, but but you're you're focusing on fatalities so the title being female fatalities in county cork specifically during the irish war of independence and the case of mrs lindsay now it's presumed that you know that, that not, not very many women were killed uh in in the the war of independence but some were um 
And there are some particularly, uh, which we might say, controversial cases of transgressive violence. Do you want to say a little bit about that, the, the women who were killed? Why is this important? And then why this case of Mrs. Lindsay? Why did you focus on that? Well, first of all, in Cork, it was a particularly violent area during the Irish Revolution. Uh, on our database that we're building up, that we're slowly releasing, myself and Professor Donnelly, uh, we, we, I think we have 850 deaths now in County Cork during the Irish Revolution, which is a substantial number of deaths, uh, accounting for a lot of the deaths in the Revolution at large, maybe 4,000 in the Revolution at large. And in that, you know, maybe there was only 25 female deaths in this period. So uh, it, it was strikingly low, but in the case of most of them were would have been killed in accidents and in, in, in crossfire and circumstances where there wasn't actually an intention to kill them. Mo most of them were like that, but there were two particularly transgressive cases, uh, the case of Mrs. Lindsay and Bridget Noble in West Cork, where two women were, were killed. And this actually, by the IRA, this actually went against IRA regulations about women spies who were, who were meant to be deported out of the country and not killed because it transgressed the code of honor at the time. And uh, these two were actually uh, uh, killed in pretty horrific circumstances. And of course, Mrs. Lindsay is perhaps the most notorious case in the entire Irish Revolution. Uh, her, her case came up in the in the in the in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords, across the British press. It was she was championed by the Morning Post, which was the most jingoistic right wing military paper uh, in the UK. And I, sp I suppose she was a quintessential member of the establishment. She lived in a big house. Uh, she was quite untypical of the women killed. Uh, she was a Protestant loyalist. Uh, she was strongly connected with uh, the General Strickland, the, the, the guy in charge of the 6th Division, most of the south of Ireland uh, in Cork, and who visited her house on a number of occasions. And her death really became part of the propaganda war. Uh, the British were arguing uh, that uh, the IRA was targeting helpless Protestant civilians, and here a helpless Protestant woman was uh, attacked. And uh, so, so this, uh, her case, of course, is remembered. Uh, the Dripsy ambush was one of the great catastrophes of the revolution in Cork when the IRA had a number of people captured and executed. And uh, uh, she, she, she certainly uh, led to this situation. Now, the, the tragedy was that actually she was trying to avoid violence and bloodshed. And uh, she'd agreed with the local priest that both sides would be tipped off. And tragically, the IRA decided not to, not to take any heed. And this resulted in uh, a number of people being captured and ex executed. Uh, the IRA reprisals, they killed about five or six British soldiers. Uh, she died and her butler died and a couple of others too on the IRA side. So it, it, it ended up with about 14 or 15 people being killed in this single episode. So it was particularly tragic. It's, it's very well remembered in Cork, particularly around Donamore uh, in that district where she was uh, captured and held and executed and buried and then uh, dug up again and her body was destroyed because the IRA didn't want her body to become part uh, of this propaganda war or that it could be used in any way with a kind of funeral. And actually the British army did commemorate her in various funeral, uh, various commemorative services in both Ballancolig and Limerick. Uh, and this itself was part of the propaganda war uh, also. So uh, I suppose she was a particularly exceptional an untypical uh, case. So again, another very tragic, very sad um, situation, you know, with a woman at the centre, but, you know, it had, a, again, a much wider repercussion and survives in the, the historical and community memory very much in, in, in that area of Cork. Um, 
we'll, we'll come back in a minute to some of these points. I'm, I'm going to move on um, to Mary. Is Mary in my call? I can't see Mary. Is she there? lost her connection I think well maybe I'm uh, oh there Mary no no I can't see her um, should, maybe we can she was there literally a second ago um, so I might keep going and then we'll come back we can come back in a minute am I missing something we'll oh, put she's, <laughs> she's back yeah Mary oh I got kicked out there <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought because I literally saw you a second ago and I said you, you can't have gone very far <laughs> okay so it, it happens actually zoom is very glitchy um sorry about that mary um so, <laughs> well it wasn't my fault but anyway um glad to have you back um so so we were just discussing there um the case of you know mrs lindsay you know she was one of the women killed and again you know she it, it, it fits very well i think that case with with your chapter um and the, the home front is battle front so again this kind of um, do you want to say a little bit about that, the home front? How, how could that, you know, the domestic space is considered to be the place of refuge where, you know, the women were, if you like, and, you know, in a sense, kind of the domestic being a very feminine space, a very safe space. And a bit like what we were talking there about Mrs. Lindsay, quite, quite the opposite, you know, and, and the role of women in that sense. So we just maybe explain for people looking in about what is that idea of the home front? I mean, it comes from other wars, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And I'm sorry, Andy, I missed um, part of what you were saying there about Mrs. Lindsay uh, in the panic to try and get back online. Um, yes, and the, the, because, of course, what we're talking about here is, is essentially a guerrilla warfare. But in all wars, obviously, this whole idea that it's men fighting men and, and there's no impact in that wider sense has been disproved against again and again. But particularly when we're talking about a guerrilla warfare where uh, one enemy, the IRA or the Republicans, are invisible. And that very invisibility reduces the safety of the civilian population because it's presumed then on the part of the Crown forces that everybody is guilty. Anybody could be a potential um, assassin or bomber or killer. Um, and therefore, in order to, to control um, what is going on and to control the war situation, um, it happens that the once the the um, RIC uh, is enhanced with the uh, black and tans and the auxiliaries, that they, as as DM Leeson said, decide to visit terror with terror, and that terror comes into the kitchen, it comes into the communities, it comes into the churches, um, and that's what I talk about in this chapter: is the idea that the domestic space, that safe space that women would be in while the men are out fighting the war is not actually a safe space. It actually becomes the front line, and in many cases, much more the front line than where the men are at. The men are on the run. Yeah. Um, they're planning ambushes. They're in many ways a little bit safer than the women, and they understand that themselves because they they talk about their own feelings of um, their, their inability to protect their women uh, because of these reprisals being carried out on communities on family homes, on isolated cottages. Um, however, the interesting thing is, as shown in your chapter and Marie's chapter and, uh, and, and Andy's, is that the Republicans and Sinn Féiners and IRA are, are attacking those safe spaces themselves as well exactly. for different reasons. So in, in many cases, we're not just talking about militant women. We're talking about civilians. We're talking about people who may have had connections with uh, militancy or political activism. You know, Kathleen Clark gets raided. Um, uh, Kathleen Lynn talks about being raided. Agnes Daly, Kathleen Clark's sister, of course, is raided in Limerick. They, they talk about being raided two, three, four times a week. And at one stage, she is, um, her hair is cut off and her hand is cut so badly uh, that uh, she she said she would have bled to death her, her sister not had first aid training uh, and managed to bandage her up um, so it's not just those women it's ordinary people who may or may not be supportive of uh, the republican cause and then on the other side it's women who are being accused of company keeping or who've had who have the potential to be 
spies or informers or that, you know, the, the uh, Republicans have decided they may have that potential. But it's also about c control on both sides, controlling the population. And, and also, maybe you say, the control of sexuality, really, in a way, because it was, yeah. again, on the IRA side, we were very, very interested in, in women's relationships with men. Um, and, you know, again, the kind of micro management wasn't there. It was also part of that. And um, yes, very much and war. Yeah. Yes, very much so. We will teach you how to be respectable Irish women, yes. true Irish women. Um, so it was very much about uh, a particular type of masculinity, you know, um, demonstrating a, a, a kind of a leadership and a masculinity that they would enforce into the Irish Free State. And we see, I think, we see the beginnings here of what will become that hegemonic masculinist free state in the behavior of Republicans towards women uh, and controlling women's, uh, who they speak to, who they see, uh, their, their uh, performance of, you know, what would be considered a deviant femininity. So teach them to be respectable, proper Irish women. Um, and all of that is happening in home spaces. Most of the raids are at night. Most of them are pulling women out of beds, be they militant women, or, or women accused of company keeping. So the terror must have been extreme, just imagining 10, 12, 14 men with big boots marching into your house, pulling you out of bed, the women clad in their night dresses. So there's an element of sexual violence there as well. And they talk about, uh, for example, Lil Conlon talks about the fact that um, the women were, were attacked and other indignities committed. You know, what's in that space? What does that mean? We have to unpack that language as well of outrage, indignity, insult, uh, because of course they don't, they, they're not open about what actually is happening other than saying their hair is cut off. The culture is, yeah, why we know from the literature that, you know, forced cutting of hair has sexual. Oh yeah, absolutely. Sexuality of women. My crowning glory, women's crowning, crowning glory, you take that off, you're defeminizing her. You know, marking the women out, you'll see in, in, in France and, and Germany, et cetera, around um, the World War II period, marking them out as wars effectively. So, so again, so that's, yeah, so, so, so again, so I think that's really, you can see very much into the interconnection between the four chapters in that section are really bringing to the fore the, those kind of complex um, dynamics and um, the raids, you know, the, 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 the compensation claims, Marie. Um, the women who were killed and the, 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 the cases, the horrific cases that were highlighted um, by the state. Um, and also, yeah, exactly. And also then in my own case, you know, looking at it and, you know, I think what readers will find is there are lots of actual examples of this in practice, um, you know, that, have, that um, the evidence is really coming to the fore. So I, I think I was going to be asked a question, but I think I'll leave it because I think we're kind of heading to the, to the homeward straight, the last section and everybody's been very patient and I know it's Friday night and we have a little bit of music at the end as well. So, so I'll move forward. So thank you very much, everyone. And that was part two of the book. And <laughs> we're on to part three now. Um, and here really, I, I know in my work and, and that's why I'm so grateful for, for Amir uh, being here this evening. But for me, it's really important to connect these kinds of empirical studies and analysis of women's lives with creativity but also with representation um, and questions around memory and commemoration. And I suppose in, in saying, in, in, as Marie was saying earlier, you know, you know, often something is in plain sight. You know, the newspapers have been used as a source since God knows however long um, since history was invented. Um, likewise, when we look around us, when we look at space and place and literature, um, it's everywhere. Women's experience and role and voice and representation is everywhere and it's in culture. And again, um, this last part of the book begins to open up those spaces, I think. Um, and um, I, for me, it's very important to work um, with scholars in, in literature. Um, I have learned so much from that. And um, so I'm going to welcome Alva. Hello, Alva. Alva McDade, Dr. Alva McDade. How are you? I are you there? Um, you need to put your microphone on. Oh, you're there. I can see you. Yeah, oh, we can't hear you though. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, there you are. Okay. Hi, Alva. Um, so the, 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 again, I'm 
a great title, um, quote unquote, when we've licked the wounds of history, um, literary representations of women's experiences of the War of Independence and Civil War. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the literary sources you looked at and how, how they do tell us about women's experience? Um, yeah. Sure, thanks Linda. And it's obviously totally, um, it's a real kind of, uh, disorientation experience in some ways being part of the uh, really strong history panel line here in the corner and uh, with with the poems but I think as Eleanor has has shown this evening and um, the power and the potency of literature as a practice and um, as an act of retrieval is just as important um, and as as significant I think as these other acts that were undertaken simultaneously um, and I loved that line from, from Eleanor's poem where she said, having found you here, I will bring something of you back. Um, and I think that's probably what underpins my, my research um, when I'm looking at the role in which literature can play. We speak a lot um, about memory and commemoration and all these kinds of things in the, this week as much as the, over the last couple of years. Um, and I don't think we reflect enough about the role that literature plays in that, not only as a reflective, um, a reflective material, but also as a projective experience insofar as it influences how we receive our history, how we reproduce our history and how we retell it. Um, a couple of other scholars have gone back and mentioned um, Louise's really important piece on those um, kind of canonical texts of the, you know, the Ernie O'Malley's and the Tom Barry's, etc. Um, and how those kind of have infiltrated how we speak about and how we envisage that period of time. Um, and what my work has been looking at is more recent um, reconfigurations of that period of, um, of history. And so I've just looked at in, in the chapter, it's obviously just a little short, it's, it's a short little excerpt of a much larger project that I'm working on. Um, and in the, in the chapter, I look at centennial reflections. So this on, on, the, on the occasion of the decade of the, of the centenaries that um, a number of contemporary writers have come back to the, the, the violence of the period. Um, and they've attempted various kinds of acts of retrieval, um, picking up on what happens in the kinds of hidden spaces and the safe spaces as Mary McCorlop just mentioned what happens within those spaces that are not recorded in those official documents in those archives that are fallen apart and that are hidden um, within that and so I suppose I think that literary practice can kind of push at the limits of yes. official memory um, and can, can, can seek out the kind of nuances um, and the detail that doesn't doesn't get historically it, attention um, because it's it's women's experiences, it's women's wars. Um, I always think about that Svetlana Alexievich uh, quote about how women's war has particular colours and particular smells and particular textures. And I think what I try to do is in my analysis of the kinds of poems like by people like Leni Quilnon, Paula Meehan, Martina Evans, um, and also even Duran Negriefa's poem um, that's at the finishes the book, that closes the book out, I feel like I need to write another piece about that because that's a beautiful um, re repossession, I suppose, a radical act of repossession of that Austin Clark, famous Austin Clark poem, uh, The Planter's Daughter. And Duran does such an amazing job of re repopulating and reclaiming that woman's narrative. Um, you know, the, the Austin Clark, um, the Austin Clark poem is, it, talks about how uh, the final line is, oh, and she was a Sunday in every week. And Duran reclaims that and she says, oh, and I blaze a Sunday through every week. And it's that kind of active reclamation um, that literature can do and, and you know, and, and can, it certainly, I, you know, it doesn't, um, I, I, I think often we try and put literature and history in opposition to each other. And I think actually they fit really nicely together in a very complex kind of a Rubik's cube that if you can shift them properly, you can get a really um, comprehensive picture of the past. Yeah, amazing. And uh, and we're very grateful for Duran Dur Grifa, who also was involved in the Unpost Book Awards last night for her wonderful achievement. It can't be with us this evening, but there is a poem by Duran that she read at the conference originally, and it is at the end of the book. And we're really grateful to, to Duran for that and for, for sharing her work. 
Um, Abba, is there one example, is there, is there a particular writer you would suggest gives us um, just one example, particular insight into this period? Um, I know people have written about Bowen, Elizabeth Bowen has an awful lot to say about that, you know, that culture of fear and violence. Um, but is there something you could, any, any kind of a exa quick example you could give us of, um, you mentioned Vihan or maybe one of those, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, there's so many, and obviously I've spoken, I've written about a couple of them in, in the chapter, like Martina Evans, um, in her volume Facing the Public, is a really, really interesting and formally kind of ambitious um, re reinterrogation, um, particularly of those kinds of narratives, and um, the Ernie O'Malley um, on Another Man's Wound. She takes direct extracts from that, um, and she she kind of goes beyond, like kind of over over the threshold, and populates it from this, the perspective of the woman of the house. You know, so those those women who were in the houses waiting for either on the runs to come um, and seek refuge are also um, uh, waiting to be to to be to be raided as well. Um, and so she, so she does some really, really uh, clever and funny kind of tongue in cheek uh, work with that. Another person who we don't really think about um, um, and some I think it was uh, I think Marie mentioned about like thinking about the descendants um, of of the, the next generation and so the, there's also kind of a generation of writers whose parents were participatory in in the the period and um, so Maeve Brennan is somebody who really interestingly writes about her childhood exposure to um to raids and to her house being kind of a site of feminist action especially um with her obviously her father was away a lot um, and her mother, Una, there being at home and, you know, all of the kind of action that was going on within the house and how the house itself became this kind of uh, kind of threatened, um, kind of unstable space that is, is regularly kind of exposed to incursions and disruptions of the domestic um, in, in her story, the, the morning after the big fire um, or uh, the, the a number of her Cherryfield Avenue stories as well. So, you know, the, and these are just kind of, these are reflections looking back at the time, but of course there's also a number of really important um, literary texts that were written at the time and um, that have not received to date as much attention as those canonical texts that, um, that, that, that Louise and that other people have written about in the past. And so we think about people like Dorothy, um, Dorothy McCardle, uh, we think about people like Maureen Cregan, like Rosamond Jacob, um, all of whom have written really important texts and really valuable um, uh, perspectives on women's involvement um, and also in the, the kind of experiences of women in coding the violence and coding the disruptions to their spaces. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's kind of all part of the larger project of, of rounding out the cultural and literary memory of this period of time, which is all part of our kind of acts of retrieval and that, that we're all undertaking. Yeah, absolutely. That's brilliant. So, so we, you know, that is true. Women as writers were very important in, in, the, in this phase. And absolutely. So acts of retrieval and, as you say, reclaiming, as, as, as Dylan did in her poem. I think, Ella, you were just mentioning in the, the chat there about Colette Bryce also talking about her experience of, of raids in Northern Ireland as perhaps being a, a, a parallel as well. So yes, yeah, so we have a, at least 17 books out of this discussion. That's another book um, up, isn't it? Um, there's so much more to be done. Um, now we're definitely on the home, thank you so much. We're definitely on the homework straight. Um, and so, so we've gone from London, New York, Dublin, Tipperary, where else have we been? Cork. Um, so we're now, we've got Limerick. We're moving west now um, to, 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 to our Galway, the Galway um, contingent. And um, so I want to welcome, this is a joint chapter by Dr. John Cunningham and Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley, who are both um, here. So you might want to uh, come on to the, the panel together. So the first, both, thanks so much for doing this chapter. I have to say, I have really admired all the work both of you have done as co-directors, you know, of, of the centre um, um, for, for, for class and gender and, and labour in Galway. That's not the right title, sorry, I'm having a senior moment. Um, but um, effectively, they're the themes of the centre. But um, many of us have really enjoyed the events and the profile you've given um, to gender and history uh, in recent years and have attended some wonderful events. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for your stint as the president of the Women's History Association. I know you've just finished, finished your term. So, so thank you both for all your work. Now your chapter 
is, you know, it, 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 it shifts our analysis. And again, this is what I love about the interconnections of these chapters, because ostensibly, the question of the institutionalization of women in mother and baby homes, vaginal and asylums, is almost presented as a kind of an aspect of social history in the 20th century that's somehow completely disconnected from this kind of militaristic view of the revolution. And yet, in Chum, which is one of the most significant sites um, uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the current politics of mother and baby homes, you have this fascinating juxtaposition of remembrance and the revolution alongside a mother and baby home where seven to 800 infants were buried, being a nice word, um, on the site um, for decades, um, a source of uh, you know, exploitation um, and maltreatment of women in Ireland, shameful uh, maltreatment. So tell us about the, 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 the title commemorating the Irish Revolution disremembering and remembering the women and children of the tomb, mother and baby home. How does that relate? Which do you want to start, John, and then I'll, 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 I'll we'll give okay. Sarah the last word. Yeah. Yeah. First, of course, I should uh, congratulate you, Linda, on getting the book out in difficult circumstances. And it's good to see everybody here tonight in all our uh, <laughs> different uh, cities and uh, countries around, uh, different cities around the world. So I suppose a commemoration and its startling absence, I suppose, in respect of those who died in the mother and baby home uh, was, um, I suppose, the, the, the starting point, more or less, um, of our uh, chapter. And we were trying to tell several parallel stories which began during the struggle for independence and indeed continue um, up to the present and aren't fully, um, aren't fully um, played out yet. Now, when we gave our paper at the uh, conference, was it two years ago? How long ago was it? 2017, <laughs> September 2017. Oh, it's three years ago. Anyway, yeah. mm -hmm. at that point, uh, Sarah Ann uh, Buckley and myself, Sarah Ann, hello, you're there somewhere. <laughs> she is. I'm here, John. Uh, <laughs> we were, uh, we were uh, at the very early stage of our work on the tomb, Mother and Baby Home, and I think uh, even just the opportunity to take it to a conference uh, kind of uh, started it on the road. Anyway, the paper has since uh, developed into the Chewham Oral History uh, Project, uh, which we're working on uh, at the moment. Uh, I suppose to the question, and you've um, mentioned this, um, alluded to this, um, Linda, um, the, I suppose the, to begin the, we would be, placing the Chewham institution uh, itself as an element of the legacy of the Irish struggle uh, for independence. It was uh, established in December 1921 as part of the reconfiguration of the poor law system by the revolutionary uh, Dáil, and it was situated initially in the burned out remnants of the Glenamady workhouse about 20 miles from Chewham, under the auspices of the uh, Bon Secours sisters, who couldn't move to Chewham till um, Free State soldiers vacated uh, the workhouse in 1925. Now, in the Chewham workhouse, there took during the occupation uh, by uh, the uh, Free State uh, forces, there took place one of the most notorious episodes of the Civil War when six local men were executed in April 1923. And this had a tremendous uh, impact uh, on the local community um, horrifying even uh, government uh, supporters indeed. And there were subsequent reinterments, two reinterments of the executed men, which kept the issue on the boil and uh, mobilized the local pop population indeed uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the funerals and so on. So it's still very much a live issue in May 1925 when the Bon Secours sisters arrive in Chum uh, from Glenamady with 85 children and the 26 uh, mothers in their care. Uh, the Bon Secours order, um, the younger sisters in particular, had been involved in visiting Republican prisoners during the War, War of Independence and uh, apparently were greatly affected by this. And on her arrival in Chewham, uh, Sister Hortense McNamara, who was the woman in charge, saw footprints 
outside the workhouse oratory, which she immediately associated with the executions. She had the area marked off, blessed, and prayers were constantly said by the sisters for the executed men, and uh, Republicans were welcomed uh, into the site to, um, uh, to, to do their own commemorations and so on. So the sisters, especially um, Hortens, uh, Mother Hortens later on, uh, became custodians essentially of the memory of the executed Republicans. And this, um, th their role in this regard was recognized by revolutionary Republicans when a plaque was erected on the oratory wall in 1985, you have seven names on the plaque, the six ex executed uh, young men and Mother Hortense. And it's interesting, I think, um, uh, it, more generally, that the sisters who were pillars of the local establishment in several respects, repeatedly cooperated in commemorations with revolutionaries uh, who were people anathemized by the political uh, mainstream. So this, uh, I suppose, presents something of a puzzle. Why were women who were so fastidious about commemorating, about memorializing the Republican dead, so apparently careless uh, with respect to the remains of those hundreds of uh, children who died in their care? Fascinating. So, um, yeah. And, and Maybe, Sarah, do you want to answer that question? Why were they so careless in a way, just to kind of build up on, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not really fascinating if you think about it, the scale of, you know, as John has said there, yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's still fairly ongoing because if we think about, obviously the report is coming out in, in January, but if we think about even the past few years and how difficult it has been to raise the issue of burials still for, survivor groups and those in the community. Um, and I guess for myself and John, it, it's this question of what was in plain sight as well in Tume. So this e extremely large monument to the Tume martyrs and so close nearby the site of the mother and baby home. And it, it just, it really, you know, it was very visual even how it struck us. Um, and I think in comparison to maybe some of the other chapters, access to records was an issue for us so we we used obviously the publicly available records but then not the private sources so i think the chapter raised a lot of questions yeah. um that i think are relevant to you know the broader history of of women and children in the 20th century and i guess in another way while we probably associate the mother and baby homes with the irish free state the genesis of the idea is there long before, so from the beginning of the 19th century. And I think that's really important too, because what we're seeing is institutions being turned into other institutions and the women primarily and the infants and children, like they're from, they're from Galway, there are some from Mayo and a small number from Clare but it's a publicly funded mother and baby home. So I just think it raises so many questions around gender and class that are that are really uh, relevant, um, not just because the Tume Institution has become, I suppose, so, so notorious, but in regards to the other institutions we have. Um, so taking this moment, this, this snapshot of the Irish revolutionary period and these events with the Tume martyrs and then the way it follows through in regards to the commemorations, there was points where you just couldn't believe that there was still all these annual commemorations of the two martyrs, and yet we're we're not having any discussion of of the women and the conditions therein. Um, so it was it was fascinating to research. Yeah. And it was even remarkable uh, at one stage um, there was a commemoration of the. Uh, paupers as they were described who died during the famine in the same place and um, uh, this was in 1947 I think on the centenary uh, so uh, there was uh, commemorations of one sort or another and reinterments of um, of different groups of people the um, uh, the, 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 the the Republican um, uh, prisoners the executed men as I said but also the the um, the, the, the dead sisters were reinterred twice when circumstances changed and they were 
setting up elsewhere. So this is very much a consciousness about um, marking uh, and memorializing uh, the, the, the deceased uh, people and yet an apparently uh, blasé uh, approach uh, to the uh, to, to, to the remains of the of the people for which they were they were responsible. It, uh, it's um, it, yeah, questions raised, uh, not all of them answered yet, uh, I, I guess. Not at all. I mean, absolutely. And, and, and in a sense, like a, a Christian burial is considered so important, you know, in terms of the church and, and, and how this could coexist. Um, you know, I, I think it says an awful lot and, and needs to be fully unpacked. And I think you asked that question very well at the end of your chapter, who do we remember and who do we commemorate? And there's a lot of discussion out there at the minute about you know, um, Kill Michael and, you know, 1970s and um, these kinds of questions you're asking, you know, uh, at the level of human rights abuses um, are extremely important, you know, so how we me memorialize, and I know the Commission is dealing with some of these issues, how we remember, how we deal with that, um, you know, um, you know, all of these questions, Bessborough in Cork, the same kinds of issues of planning permission um, at the moment in for, um, you know, apartments, houses on, on, a, on, a, on a similar burial site, um, effectively. So, so thank you very much. This is a really, really important um, set of questions, I think. And it does, I suppose, brings full circle in a way in this collection, that interplay between past and present, you know, that there is an empirical task to be done of the study of all of these questions in their own right. Um, but also we, these questions, I suppose, continue to re-emerge. And I think what I call them in, in my work elsewhere, women's troubled and troubling history, um, continues to re-emerge in contemporary injustices, in contemporary questions uh, around human rights and, and who we remember. Um, I think Catherine Corliss um, is to be commended, isn't she, for the work she did, uh, exceptional historical research. Um, yeah led to this you know so thank you so so i think we can bring everyone back on the camera and my, my my invisible assistants are helping me out here i want to thank anne hamilton black and, and orla dunn in particular because they're, they're helping me with this um book launch from my from my sitting room as i as i said earlier on so so uh, everyone can come back on and this brings me full circle i'm just conscious there's some there aren't many questions coming in on the public q a it's mostly glowing comments about everybody and well wishes and we can we'll go through those after we just to thank everybody for those thank you so much um i i'm not sure how many people we have we certainly have at least 100 on here this evening and i think we're live on facebook as well so it's probably millions um at this stage <laughs> so so thank you everybody for being here um so we're coming to the the end and um I just have two things really to end with. So, so, so first of all, I just want to thank each of you, the authors, for, for all your work. And I think this collection, as I said, it was very important. Edited books are, are not as valued, frankly, as the monographs and the journal articles. But I think this is an example of how we must, we must work together and we must collaborate. And, um, and not just in that kind of chauvinistic view um, uh, you know, of history in the sense that we can expand and look at literature and look at other questions and have this kind of conversation. Um, and, and I mean, the double-edged meaning of chauvinistic as well, that we are looking at women and it's, it's women's history, but it's also historians of the revolution, it's political scholars, it's literary scholars, um, et cetera. But there's an awful lot to be mined here and uh, long may it continue. And I hope the book will be useful um, to researchers and to the general public. I know from my own work, um, just to pick up there, sources are difficult as well, Sarah and, and, and John, in, in some of the work I've done. Um, there is a fight to get um, papers on particular cases opened up. You have to fight and you have to advocate to get some of these um, questions um, and papers opened so you can write about them. And it's long and laborious and it's very hard work. So, um, so well done, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of this book and I'm really proud of you all as colleagues. Um, and thank you so much for, for this work, particularly in the pandemic. Um, this will always be our pandemic book, by the way. This, um, and, and thank you, Eleanor, as well, um, for, for being with us 
this evening and it's been lovely as i said to 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 to, to have conversations with you about our mutual interest in our research and our work um, and thank you to darren and also liz gillis who wrote a preface um, as well and liz has her own collection of photographs photographic collection as well and, and other historical work um, that has been so useful to any of us so um i just want to thank um Irish Academic Press again, and to say the book is available, the bookshops are open actually again, which is a plus, but www.iap.ie, you can buy it online, it's 24 euros, so it's, it's, a, it's a steal. And um, I want to thank um, the, the Jack B. Yates um, estate for the use of, of the cover, thank you so much, and uh, the Cork Public Museum um, for our, our back um, uh, cover here as well. And um i want to um thank uh, i better thank my family because they're all locked up in various parts of the house currently i have three teenagers um, i want to thank uh, benjamin rosa and emily bielenberg who have been uh, great they haven't made a sound um i want to thank andy who as we know was up in the attic for most of this um but honestly uh, completing a book as i said in a pandemic i don't know how uh, we all did it but anyway junior certs and everything else going on. So, so as I said, we'll remember this one, I think forever. So thank you everybody. Um, and I just want to end, so we're going to, um, um, a, 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 a very special um, young person is going to play us out and uh, this evening. And um, I also have a very um, special message as well from Uktaran uh, Heron for us, which I've been saving. And um, I received a letter today from uh, President Michael D. Higgins um, wishing us well, and we'll put that up at the end so you can read it. Um, and I just want to thank him for his support and inclusion of women. Um, he was known to me as a wonderful sociology lecturer in Galway before he ever um, entered politics, and he doesn't forget the sociologist Louise, and he includes us, and he, he is... Um, historically minded, I think his speech last Friday in, um, in, in our suit on the commemoration was utterly astonishing and we're very lucky to have a president. So we're even lucky that he wrote a letter about this book. So, so, so what I'm going to do is end by thanking everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce, um, as I said, a, a, a performance in a moment. And then what we'll do is we'll put up the letter from the president at the end so people can read it and feel free to all the contributors to go into the chat and have a look and respond if if you wish on the, on the public chat um i'm going to introduce now um as i said a special young young person um leisha doherty who's from coronara foxford county mail um she's the daughter of tom doherty and his wife Clara. and um leisha's aunt Idel has been uh, also collaborating with me and another colleague, Frank Fagan, in County Mayo, and, and one of the women who features in my chapter, Margaret Doherty, who was from Coronara. And um, Leisha is a, a wonderful musician, as are all her family, her, her siblings, her cousins, her dad. Um, and uh, Leisha's going to play for us now, play us out on the harp. And um, Leisha, thank you so much. You're, you're, you're magnificent. Um, I love um, your your music and I feel very honoured that you're here tonight and hello to all the Doherty's in, in Foxford. Leisha is the, the great grandniece of Maggie Doherty um, her granddad and Tom who have also had the pleasure um, of meeting. So on that note, Leisha you're going to play us out. Um, thank you everybody um, for contributing in these challenging times it's been great to get everybody together and I look forward to seeing you all in person and um, we have to do something in person when all this is over, even if it's just we'll have a, an event or a conference or something. But in the meantime, um, everybody, happy Christmas, um, stay safe, um, take care and we shall continue to, to uh, work towards including women um, in the study of revolutions and the Irish Revolution. So um, uh, good night, everybody, and I'll hand you over to Leisha and then uh, we'll throw on the hair. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. We're going to be playing it on the land to be a new book from all the Doherty family in Foxford.